Okay, so we are going to be starting this new unit that we had mentioned talking about American imperialism. So we're gonna be moving past the era of manifest destiny and moving into when the United States started to colonize and imperialize uh, other nations in the Pacific, in Latin and South America and other areas around the world. So in your notes, you see it's talking about how to Theodore Roosevelt and other progressives, Theodore Roosevelt being the president, improving the United States meant that the US could control other nations. They saw the United States being able to move up in the world by saying, hey, we can control other nations, which really means, hey, we want their resources. So since we were, air quotes, improved, why not try to improve other nations? They saw it as their duty or their job. So pretty much the United States saw it as our role was to, or our responsibility was to, quote, fix other nations, make them civilized in their minds. So we talked about Roosevelt. He believed that the United States, these are your details and examples. You can make sure to include that. Roosevelt, you know, he believed that the U.S. should have a huge, powerful army and navy to show that the United States was this improved nation that other nations needed to try to be, in his opinion. So he said, hey, we've got the strong military, we've got the strong Navy, we wanna show that we are the best, not only to show that we are exceptional, but to also deter any potential threats. So Roosevelt was quoted as saying, you know, speak softly and carry a big stick, you will go far. So he said, you know what, we don't have to speak real loud and show up real loud as long as we've got the military to back it up. And so he created uh, close to 11 battleships in three years that he called the Great White Fleet, which is fitting. But um, so he went on a tour around the world to kind of show off and in many ways intimidate other countries. And so uh, this was the new way of viewing American foreign intervention, and it made a lot of people nervous about what was to come uh, going forward. That gets us to our next section. This is Jose Marti, and he was a Cuban who was exiled from the country by the occupying Spanish government. And so he reported on the power of banks and warned that the American imperialism will endanger those like his readers. And so the example you need to make sure to include, uh, he traveled to the U.S. to build support for Cuban liberation from Spain because Spain had colonized uh, Cuba. And so he wanted to talk about how horrible the social conditions was in Latin America. He wanted to tell the public about it. And so uh, he reported on the banks, like I mentioned, and uh, Roosevelt even advocated even more American intervention in the affairs of Latin America. So just like we had mentioned earlier, the uh, Roosevelt saw that as the United States job to interfere, to help our own interests. And so this guy Marti wrote about U.S. schemes to annex northern Mexico and to control the currencies of the Americas, so to control the money in North and South America. Um, he warned about, you know, a greedy dictatorship-like republic and the growing lustfulness of the United States. So he said that the United States was wanting to control everything. And so uh, this example at the bottom, they need to make sure to include the Roosevelt Corollary. So uh, corollary, the Roosevelt corollary. So pretty much the Roosevelt law. Um, it stated that the U.S. would intervene in the financial affairs of Latin America wherever it was necessary to prevent European nations from having any hold over Latin America. So in many ways, this is just the United States saying, hey, we will intervene in any country that has European uh, threats. Now that makes the United States sound like a great and wonderful thing when really they're just wanting to have control over that whole area. And so we move on to what we're gonna call talking about the white man's burden. So this was, uh, the United States was convinced of white superiority and many Americans adopted this vision of the white man's burden. So we're gonna really uh, analyze this political cartoon on the right going forward but it was kind of viewed as like the United States, it was their duty or responsibility to help all the quote, helpless non-white people of the world. And so um, the control was not really though out of a desire to control or it was not 
done out of a desire to control, but instead a moral desire to help those who cannot help themselves. But that in itself is kind of looking down on others just to begin with, but we'll get to that. And so you need to make sure to include that this racist rationalizing was the fact that European powers were dividing up and conquering much of the world in Africa and Asia. So it pushed the United States to say, hey, we have to also take control of this. And so the United States didn't want to be left behind the other European countries. So they had to demonstrate this growing power. And so the colonies, they were, uh, they were really financially advantaged, not only because they were able to get this natural resources, but they also were able to have these markets serve as products uh, to be made in the home country. So this burden, as the United States uh, said, came with the financial advantage of establishing American colonies. So the United States was like, yes, we're going to take on all these countries, but really we're going to make fortunes off of the resources that are available in those countries. And so these foreign markets were important to the U.S. because they were the leading power after coming into the 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s. The United States saw it important to make sure that they were still the top nation. And so you also, at this uh, example at the bottom, you need to know that capitalism could only thrive and expand as long as people purchase the products of industry. So the United States, which is a capitalist country, could only survive as long as we found new places for people to buy our stuff. And so that stuff being these new colonies. And so now that we had com completely expanded as far as we could in the United States West, we had to find new areas to find resources, that being in these colonies that we would start adding. And so this is where we get to this big stick uh, corollary. So Roosevelt, uh, President Teddy Roosevelt issued the Roosevelt Corollary in conjunction with the Monroe Doctrine, which we covered last year has pretty much become the international police. We literally started to police the world and to assure um, it's called hegemony over strateg strategically important regions in the Western hemisphere. So pretty much saying that we have power over regions in the West. So in the Americas, Latin and uh, or North and South America that we have control over that. So uh, the US, we formed the foundation of the belief, this is your example, that the US had the right to interfere in issues going on in Latin America, South America, and the Caribbean. So pretty much that's the United States saying, yeah, because we are powerful, we have a right to intervene in these countries. But that goes completely, it could go completely against against what the people of that country wanted, their own desires of that country. So on your next slide, you see that American sugar, this is gonna be a major factor, is that sugar plantation owners took up this white man's burden and looked towards Hawaii. And so in Hawaii, this was before Hawaii was a state, it was its own kingdom. Um, they engineered a coup, the United States sugar plantation owners. So these elites engineered a coup, which is an overthrow of the government to dethrone Hawaii's queen, uh, Little Kalani. So that was the queen of Hawaii. And so, you know, Hawaii had the perfect uh, climate to grow sugar, pineapples, coconuts, and other uh, goods that were really worth a lot of money for the United States. So the United States saw that as a place to exploit and take control over. And so these plantation owners got the approval of William McKinley, who was the president right before Roosevelt, and he signed a resolution, which is like a law, saying that we're going to annex Hawaii. So they didn't even ask Hawaii if they wanted to become a part of the United States. But we just said, hey, we are going to make you a colony, essentially. And so this would uh, deny Japanese, Japan the ability to expand and take over Hawaii instead. So we saw it as a way to limit threats to our power. And it had an excellent port for battleships at Pearl Harbor, which will become really important in World War II. 
So this was really important as a way for the United States to continue expanding out west into Southeast Asia. So onto your next slide, you see that the United States looked to Cuba as well as a way um, to pretty much as a way to add on to an, as another colony for its own resources. So the United States looked to Cuba in their backyard, which is literally 90 miles from Miami, as the white media depicted the Cubans as helpless and terrorized. So we see in this picture, we see anarchy. So the media is describing Cuba as being this helpless country and because of Spain misusing them. So the United States is depicting as, hey, it's our duty to save, air quotes, the Cuban people from the Spanish empire. So the Cubans were fighting for independence uh, and in an attempt to quell the uprising, the Spanish rounded up Cubans and forced them into concentration camps. And this killed thousands of Cubans. So Spain, which was a uh, European empire, they had colonized Spain or uh, Cuba, excuse me. And they wanted to keep control of Cuba. So they were putting down any kind of people that were rising up against them. They're putting them in these camps and killing them all. So what's interesting though, is that how the white media in the United States depicted Spain was completely different than how the black media depicted uh, that Cubans could achieve their own independence. So the white media made it seem like it was the role of the United States to come in and save these helpless Europe or, uh, Cubans. Whereas in reality, the black media showed it that the Cubans wanted to achieve their own independence. They wanted to have their own independence and not have to rely on the United States. So uh, we see that the Cubans rose up in rebellion against Spain and the political leaders of the United States kind of erased or whitewashed the history of Cubans struggling to get their own version of uh, independence and made it sound like the United States came in and saved the day for them. That's the main thing you need to focus on is the two different depictions of how the media showed the Spanish or the Cuban people rising up. So the guy that we mentioned earlier, Jose Marti, he saw this importance of winning Cuban independence before the U.S. got involved because he feared that the United States would end up seizing control of the country or the island and the independence would have a new enemy. So essentially he saw, hey, if we get rid of Spain, then we'll just end up having the United States as like a new ruler. And he didn't want that. And he knew the people didn't want that. So um, there was no real trust to US intervention. The United States um, or the Cuban people did not really trust the Americans to truly liberate them. They just saw them as coming in and wanting to take advantage of the situation. And so the United States was a, they saw the U.S. as a nation that built oppressive structures instead of liberating people. And so they wanted to um, have their own liberty. So in order to prevent the possibility of U.S. annexation of Cuba, Congress passed the Teller Amendment, which proclaimed that the U.S. would help the Cuban people gain their freedom from Spain, but not annex the island after victory. So this Teller Amendment that said that, yeah, the United States will help um, free the people, but we cannot annex it. And so the U.S. initiated what became the Spanish-American War to, quote, bring independence to Cuba. And so the American newspapers built tons of uh, encouragement and support for the war by reporting about these uh, really sensational stories that were really made up and kind of like the early versions of fake news. So some examples you need to make sure to include is talking about um, they were wanting to sell copies and really get people into a frenzy against the Spanish by reporting these crazy stories. So uh, this first thing you need to make sure to know is yellow journalism. And so that was these, this journalism that is based on sensation and exaggeration. So pretty much comparison, unfair comparisons and lies. That's what yellow journalism is. And that's what was used to get the American public to want to fight in this war. And so 
Uh, the oppressed Cubans, they claimed, were suffering at the hands of Spain, just as the United States has done in the American Revolution. So they're making these unfair comparisons to get the United States, the citizens of the United States, to want to fight in this war. And so the U.S. sent the warship USS Maine, as it says, into Havana Harbor to protect Americans and their assets. But just nine days after the arrival, the Maine exploded, and that killed 260 American soldiers. Now, the Spanish claimed uh, that the explosion had been the result of, like, an accident. It was an accident. But the Americans were convinced that the Maine had been destroyed by the Spanish soldiers. So that got the public wanting to fight, ready to fight. And so we see that the U.S. ended up declaring war on Spain on April 11, 1898. And so Secretary of State John Hay declared the conflict what he called a splendid little war because it was a short war. It lasted just over three months, and Spain agreed to free Cuba and to give the islands of Guam and Puerto Rico to the United States. So because the United States won this war so quickly, um, the United States was given uh, the islands of Guam and Puerto Rico, and then Spain agreed to free Cuba. Um, and although Cuba was freed, they had to acknowledge that the U.S. had control in their constitution, which kind of goes against everything in the Teller Amendment. So Cuba had to agree to permit American diplomatic, economic, and military inter intervention and to give Guantanamo Bay for the United States to use. So pretty much Cuba was free in name only, and then they had all these other uh, controls that the United States had over Cuba. And so the United States, we see, agreed to pay Spain $20 million for the Philippines. So now the United, United States also has control of the Philippines. So all of these different island nations were just handed over to the United States, and the United States just took control of it. And so um, the United States just like in Cuba, refused to give the freedom to the Filipino people. And so another example of the United States wanting to have control over these countries that they viewed as savage or uncivilized, they said that they needed to have control of, quote, their little brown brothers. So that was William Howard Taft, said that the Filipino people were not capable of controlling themselves, so they needed the United States. So once again, we see this example of the United States feeling that they were the only country that was able to have this kind of control. And so getting close to the last part of our section, we see that Jim Crow, which we talked about in our last unit, talking about Jim Crow, the racial segregation, was able to find its way to Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. So the Filipino people fought for independence against Spain only to win and then have to fight again against the U.S. So the Filipino people, we then go to war against the Filipino people to try and have control, can maintain control over the Philippines. And so the U.S. did not want to bring black workers to the Philippines because they believed that black workers would uh, build labor unions with the Filipinos and fight for decent wages. So another example of solidarity that the U.S people in power feared, they feared that black workers would align with the Filipino people and overthrow the white superiority there, the white supremacy there. And so we, uh, we see that the U.S. ended up crushing any labor in Puerto Rico the same way that they did in the United States. And this last section, um, the victims of American imperialism, so, you know, the people of Cuba, the people of the Philippines, the people of Guam, the people of uh, Puerto Rico, they started to find solidarity on the mainland in the United States with the people of color. So people of color, like African Americans, the Hispanic Americans, were able to find commonalities with the people who were oppressed in these other island nations. And many Black publications frequently showed how racial capitalism and imperialism worked hand in hand. So the United States going out and colonizing these other nations, these other island nations, was not just to bring civilization. It was to exploit them for their resources. 
and the people who suffered were the people of color. And so we see black publications expose the power of Wall Street to determine US foreign policy. So we see that American imperialism was about economic success and domination, and it was never truly about freedom and liberty for other nations. 